wherever you are staying safe and uh, we are going to talk about the only principle that required explanation in terms of two different phenomena and you see the pictures of uh, Maxwell and Feynman and you recognize that I'm obviously not talking about the wave particle duality or quantum mechanics I'm talking about a phenomenon from the field of electrodynamics so why the title is a little bit longish consisting of uh, several words will become clear in just a very short while so we are used to being introduced to the subject of electrodynamics In historical perspective we often begin with the cool Law, the Coulomb Gauss law, as it may be called, Ampere's law, Ohm's law, then the Lenz Faraday law, Kirchhoff's laws, Henry's. And then we get to the point of being introduced to Maxwell's equations. And uh, one of the objectives of uh, my talk today would be to reverse this method of teaching. Uh, begin with the Maxwell's equations and then teach everything Coulomb's law, Ampere's law, and so on through backward integration in a very straightforward manner. It will be a very efficient way of doing it. And uh, I will explain this in just a few moments. So you, you see this uh, relationship on this slide, J equal to sigma E. And I'm sure most of you recognize this as the Ohm's law. This is a constitutive uh, relation. Uh, it tells you that a current flows because there is a potential difference and then the charge is transported. So this is what we recognize as the Ohm's law. The current would flow, the charge would be transported uh, current is requires transportation of electric charge. This would happen when there is a potential difference. So the potential difference is the primary cause, and this is some sort of a cause effect relationship. Uh, this is what we recognize as the Ohm's law. Then we are also familiar with Kirchhoff's laws. And there are two laws over here. One is that the sum of the currents at a node which take into consideration all the currents which flow in and which flow out, as you see in this figure over here. All this inward current and the outward current adds up to zero. And this is a good reason, this is a good diagram which would tell you, um, notwithstanding how it is claimed in some books that current is a vector because it has got a magnitude and direction, and here you see that the currents add up according to the Kirchhoff's laws and not according to the vector law of addition. So current is not a vector. Um, it, it adds according to the Kirchhoff's laws, not according to the vector law of addition of vectors. The second law of Kirchhoff is that the sum of the voltage drops across different circuit elements in a closed circuit is zero. And this is going to play a big role in our subsequent discussion. So let's have a look at it now. So we have these constitutive relationships, Ohm's law, the Kirchhoff's laws, and now we come across a very interesting experiment. This experiment has a simple circuit. So PQ is a straight wire connector and this connector can sort of slide on this arm, on the arm at the top and on the arm at the bottom. So this is, uh, it makes a contact both at the top and at the bottom, but the contact can be at different points on these horizontal circuit elements. Then there is uh, uh, an ammeter over here, which would kick if there is a current flowing in the circuit. And what you notice, is that there is no battery anywhere in this circuit. But what you do have 
is a magnetic field in the shaded area and this is indicated by the tail of an arrow which is over here which means that you have got a magnetic field which is orthogonal to the plane of the figure and it is pointed inward into the figure and now the experiment is the following that this circuit element pq which can actually slide on the arms at the top and the arms at the bottom if this circuit element is given it is physically moved to the right so here is a velocity and an arrow which shows that it is being moved to the right so if you do that if you move it slightly to the right if you had a positive charge on this circuit element as the electron charge density tends to get restored in the circuit you will end up having a current flowing in this circuit and the reason is that this charge element it experiences a force it picks up a velocity toward the right which is because you have physically moved the circuit pq toward the right so it picks up this velocity and then the lorentz force which is v cross b times the charge it sets it it exerts a force accelerates it from q to p and that is what sets up the force so the cause of this current now is the lorentz force so that is the fundamental cause which is responsible for the generation of this current when you move the circuit element if you now do a slightly different experiment which is what i'm going to show in the next slide so this is the one that we have seen on this slide is what you often call as a motional emf because it is the motion of the circuit element pq which is responsible for this so now on the next slide we have a slightly different experiment and in this experiment it is the magnetic field which is moved to the left the circuit element pq is left absolutely untouched and we know that even in this case there is a current which is which kicks off in this circuit and it is uh, noticed by the deflection of this needle in your emitter so now we are asking what is the cause of this current and what is strange about it is that the test charge q which was on the circuit element is no longer moving because pq is completely at rest you're not moving the circuit element pq anymore so the lorentz force that you used earlier v cross b the q into v cross b which is what we invoked to explain to account for the current in the circuit we cannot use that reason anymore the charge velocity is essentially zero instead what what has happened is that the magnetic field itself is moved to the left and of course like we discussed in the context of the kirchhoff's laws there is no battery anywhere in the circuit and this should come as a surprise as a total shock because you do not have a source of battery you do not have uh, any any chemistry going on over here you do not have any lorentz force operating over here and you still have a current so the lorentz force cannot be invoked anymore the velocity of the charge is essentially zero yet you have a current and this is because the magnetic flux phi which is going which is crossing the circuit is changing with time so del phi by del t is not zero and you have a totally different reason which has nothing to do with Lo the lorentz force which must be invoked and it is very important to highlight that these two are completely different causes and very often this experiment is discussed in high school physics and students who come to undergraduate education in college uh, are introduced to this in the high school and they come 
sometimes or very often I mean, my experience is that almost all the students have this idea that what is a big deal this is just uh, relativity um, uh, relative motion is whether the charge um, uh, carrying the, the charge carrying circuit element pq is moved or the magnetic field is moved what is the big deal there is a relative motion and that is all that matters and it is just the same phenomenon and they base this argument on the principles of galilean relativity that when you and i are walking toward each other it doesn't matter whether you're walking toward me or i walk toward you we do get closer and that's the galilean relativity and it, the principle which is involved over here is not that because the lorentz force is nowhere invoked in the lens faraday law what is invoked is that if there is a magnetic flux which is changing with time del phi by del t is not zero and that is what sets up the electromotive force and i would like to quote um feynman about this so essentially this appears as one of the equations in um the, the one of the four famous equations of maxwell that the curl of e is equal to minus del b by del t so that is how it shows up in maxwell's equations uh, this happens even if you are not moving the magnetic field nor are you moving the circuit element but you just change the magnitude of the magnetic flux and you can do it by controlling um, uh, some sort of a regulator uh, which is controlling the um, whatever is generating the magnetic field and you can change the value of the magnetic field externally and the moment you have a magnetic field which changes with time del phi by del t then a current is set up so there is a different reason which has nothing to do with the lorentz force law which is involved in the, in the generation of a potential difference which is what sets up the current in the circuit so the essential point is that this is not Galilean relativity. Its explanation needs um, the minds of people like Lenz and Faraday and Maxwell, and you will see how it impacts Einstein's theory of relativity. So I will be getting to that in just a moment. So there are completely two different phenomena. One is the Lorentz force. So if you're moving the circuit element PQ from left to right, then you have a Lorentz force, and this is the principle which you invoke. But when you are moving the magnetic field from right to left, again, you have a current a circuit, and now you are no longer invoking the Lorentz force. What you're invoking is the lens Faraday Maxwell law, which is the curl of E, which is equal to minus del b by del t and it is this flux b dot ds which is changing with time whose time derivative is not zero anymore and feynman points out that there is no other place in physics where such a simple and accurate general principle requires for its real understanding and analysis in terms of two different phenomena so one of the greatest teachers of physics uh, generations of physicists have learned fundamentals of physics from richard feynman and he highlights this particular experiment as a unique one and points out to us that there is no other place in physics where such a simple and accurate general principle requires for its real understanding an analysis in terms of two different phenomena and this is the title of the talk that i have chosen this morning for you so this is really a very unique situation and what is important is that we know from experiments in electrodynamics that the lens faraday maxwell law or the biot sobert ampere maxwell law these are valid for any general cases they do not these are not restricted to any particular geometry, like having a rectangular circuit element or anything like that. And the universality of this is extremely important in understanding the importance of these laws. So essentially what have we 
found now that the Ohm's law told us what we began with in this, in, in, in this discussion this morning, that if you have a potential difference, then it is responsible for making the charge to move. It is transported from one end to the other, and the potential difference is then the cause of the current, which is constituted by the electric charge in motion. And now we see that the source of this current, the cause of this current is not just a potential difference which is generated by the presence of an electric charge, uh, but it is something different. So when you look at the Ohm's law, there is a cause effect relationship that there is a cause of the potential difference. The effect is the current which flows. And this is just like the Newton's cause effect relationship in mechanics that force is the cause of the change in momentum f equal to dp by dt which is why Feynman calls the Ohm's law as Newton's law of electricity but what we have seen is that the voltage difference can be generated also by a changing magnetic flux so there is a different source that can also generate a voltage difference and set up a current which is what we have seen in this lens faraday maxwell experiment and the electromotive force is then generated by the changing magnetic flux which is minus del phi by del t so there is an alternative cause that we must now reconcile with so this is not galilean relativity it needs lens faraday maxwell and i will explain how it brings us to einstein so the unique feature of this experiment that it is the only place in physics where two different phenomena must be involved is a tremendous opportunity to teach some very beautiful concepts in physics and that is what the rest of this talk will be about so first of all i would like to highlight that this is a great opportunity to teach that there are alternative sources of the electric and magnetic field I mean, we not we only think that okay if there is a if the, there is an electric charge which is present then an electric field would be generated and we are thinking of the coulomb's law in that context or if there is a steady current which is flowing in a circuit element then there is a magnetic field but then then what we have just discovered is that there are these alternative sources of the electric and the magnetic field we also come to terms with the unity of the electromagnetic field which is the fundamental idea in maxwell's equations and um, this is often uh, brought out but not adequately emphasized the third point is not only the unity of the electric and the magnetic field but also optics because light also becomes a member of the same family the fourth point that we have an opportunity to teach our students is the role of symmetry in physics and i will comment on that the fifth point is that here is a tremendous opportunity to teach Lorentz contraction, time dilation, and the special theory of relativity. And then there is a sixth point which, which we should highlight and bring out in teaching this phenomenology, which is the importance of the divergence and the curl of a vector field. So, so these are some of the elements which I will now discuss in the rest of this talk. So um, there is more to the potential difference uh, being the cause of transport of charge as is contained in the Newton's laws of electricity. There is this changing magnetic flux. And now the more fundamental question is, what is it that sets up the electric field? What is it that sets up the potential difference, the voltage difference? and makes a charge move from one point in space to another. What is it that is responsible for the transportation of electric charges? So one is of course that the presence of an electric charge, which is coming from the Coulomb's law essentially. So that is something that we know and students know from their school physics. And what we have just been introduced to is that there is a changing magnetic field 
we can also set up um, an electric field. And then there is a third thing that if you have a dielectric medium which is polarized, so the medium on the whole may be neutral, but if it is polarized, then again, you can have a potential difference which is generated and an electric field can be set up. So there are these alternative sources of electric fields. And recognizing these three sources, three sources as independent sources, not only helps us understand Maxwell's equations in matter, we, we get to appreciate the fact that the physics that is contained in Maxwell's equations in matter is really not different from the physics that is contained in Maxwell's equations in vacuum. It's only that the sources of electric field are not just the charge, but there are these three alternative charges and they make their impact both through the divergence and the curl of the vector field. So we'll see that this is the same thing even when it gets to the magnetic field, which is no surprise because there is a certain unity in the electric and the magnetic field. So we can ask the same question, what is it that sets up a magnetic field? And we know that yes, a current can set up, can set up a magnetic field. So, so that is the Ampere's law that we know from uh, development of um, uh, electrodynamics. But then, just like the changing magnetic field, so notice that there is a certain symmetry playing an impactful role in this particular situation. That just that, just like the changing magnetic field could produce uh, an electric field, a changing electric field also produces a magnetic field. And then there is a third source, which is the intrinsic quantum magnetic moment that um that that is there in fundamental particles and uh, most of all we are concerned over here with electrons and there is no need to invoke um you know artificial ideas like rotation uh, which which is responsible for the electron spin these are intrinsic properties and any analogy with uh the top or an electron going in orbits is not at all required over here. It leads to misleading concepts. This is an essentially quantum phenomenon. It comes from the quantum angular momentum associated with which there is a quantum magnetic movement. And then of course, you can also invoke, if you have a mind uh, which is as clever as that of Dirac, you can think of a magnetic monopole also, which could be the source of the magnetic field. Um, but that will that brings us into very subtle aspects and I will not be getting into that. But recognizing these three alternative sources, the current, the changing electric field, and the quantum magnetic moment, which particles have, and in particular, we are talking about electrons and matter, and that these are alternative sources uh, of the magnetic field. So this will immediately help us synthesize Maxwell's equations in matter with Maxwell's equations in vacuum in a very direct and straightforward manner. So if you look at the Maxwell's equations in matter and those in vacuum are only a special case of the same. So you've got Maxwell's first equation, which is uh, the divergence of D as rho f, but now you can have the charge coming from the free or mobile charge, but it can also be the bound charge. The bound charge, which is not mobile, so it, it, it is not something which can be transported from one end of a conductor to another end of a conductor. It is, um, it, it, it is what you can find in a polarized dielectric and then the second alternative source is the changing magnetic field, which is coming from the lens Faraday Maxwell um, experiment or Maxwell equation, right? So
So if you ask the simple question about what is that it what is it that sets up the magnetic field, then you rule out the possibility of monopoles. So we are not getting into the direct monopole at this point. And the divergence of B therefore goes to zero, which is the third of Maxwell's equations. The fourth of Maxwell's equation recognizes alternative sources of the magnetic field. One is the current, okay? One is the current. Then you have a chain electric field, which is del E by del T. So just the way you had del B by del T, the changing magnetic field was a source of electric field. You have a changing electric field, which can be a source of the magnetic field. And then you can have, you do not have a polarization of the kind you had in the electrical case, but you have intrinsic quantum magnetic movements and the curl of the magnetization can be a source of the magnetic field. And notice that these are coming from the expressions for the divergence and curl. And you really need both the divergence as well as the curl um, to get the fields. So the unity of the electric and the magnetic uh, phenomena is beautifully displayed in these equations. In the Maxwell's equations, you have got uh, vector functions of electrical properties which are connected to the vector functions of the magnetic properties. And obviously, you see the unity in all its beauty over here in these equations. Yet, there is a more beautiful way of demonstrating the unity of electromagnetic field because the Maxwell's equations tell you that E and B are related. They are not still telling you that their components can actually be superposed. So when can you superpose things? When do you add up things? When you add or subtract? And here in the equation that you see over here, EY minus a constant times BZ, you're taking a component of the magnetic field and adding it to a component of the electric field. And so, so here it is, is an admixture, a superposition of the electric and magnetic phenomena because they are really essentially the same thing. So I will get to that in just a moment. So this is the unity of the electromagnetic field that you see in a very beautiful manner in Maxwell's equations. And you also see that not only the unity of the electric and the magnetic field, but also the unity with optics, with light. And this is what Maxwell himself recognized. Because when you take the curl of the curl equations, the four Maxwell's equations, you get the wave equation. And you've got two wave equations, one for the electric field and the other for the magnetic field. And the wave propagates at a speed, which is one over square root of properties of vacuum. The magnetic permeability of vacuum and the electric permittivity of vacuum. So this is a very surprising element because whenever we talking we talk about speed we, we we are always talking about the relative speed the speed of a car relative in relation to the ground but if there is another car which is chasing the previous car at the same speed behind it then the relative speed between the two becomes essentially zero and here we do not see the observer come anywhere into the picture. We have got a wave which propagates at a speed which is determined completely by properties of vacuum and by nothing else. Nothing to do with the observer's frame of reference. So it is a universal constant. This is what we call as a speed of light. And Maxwell noticed that this velocity is so nearly that of light as was measured in Maxwell's time, um, the speed of light was not measured as accurately as it is known today, but sure enough, it was known, it was measured to a reasonable level of accuracy and Maxwell recognized that it is the same speed as that of the electromagnetic waves, which is determined by properties of uh, vacuum, which is mu zero, epsilon zero. 
So you um, see the unity of the electromagnetic field and light. And then the fourth point that you can teach in this context is the role of symmetry in physics. Now, symmetry is an extremely important idea in physics. It has now become a cornerstone of modern physics and the standard model of physics. And you see that Maxwell's equations are beautifully symmetric. And this was possibly the inspiration be behind Noether's work. And she recognized that symmetry is a very important element. And this is, this can very simply demonstrated that if you have a homogeneous medium um, in which uh, translations can be car carried out um, without uh, seeing any change in the environment. So that is the symmetry which is important. And this will be responsible for the momentum to be conserved. So the momentum which is canonically conjugate to a cyclic coordinate, if the Lagrangian is symmetric with respect to this coordinate, then this momentum is conserved. And this is a simplistic expression of this very famous theorem named after Amy Noether. So this is a very important element which we can bring out from the beauty that is contained in the symmetry of Maxwell's equations. Noether's theorem is of course extremely important this is what Albert Einstein himself wrote about Noether, that in the judgment of most competent living mathematicians, Prolin Noether was the most significant creative mathematical genius thus far produced since higher education of women began. In the realm of algebra, she discovered methods which have proved of enormous importance. And she's in fact often recognized as the mother of modern algebra. And this importance of symmetry was perhaps inspired by the symmetry in Maxwell's equations. The fifth point that we have an opportunity to bring out and um, uh, generate some excitement amongst the students is the fundamentals of the special theory of relativity. I just mentioned that the wave equation, which comes out of Maxwell's equations, this wave propagates at a constant speed, which is c, which is one over square root of mu zero and epsilon zero, which are properties of vacuum. And if speed is the same in every inertial frame, even if these frames are moving with respect to each other, and speed being distance divided by time, if speed is not changing, then distance must change and time must change between these two observers. So when distance changes, you are led to the idea of Lorentz contraction. And when time changes, you are led to the idea of time dilation. And this is what goes into the essentials of the special theory of relativity. What it tells us, that even if we are looking at, when we are looking at Maxwell's equations, we are looking at derivatives, partial derivatives with respect to space and time. But space and time are not independent of each other. Together, they form a continuum. And you can measure distances between points in the space-time continuum. And this idea of distance is obviously different from the idea of distance between uh, two points in the Euclidean space because the space-time continuum is not a Euclidean space. As a matter of fact, it is what is called as non-Euclidean space. So the measure, which is the metric of how you measure distances between two points. So for example, in a two-dimensional Euclidean plane, the distance between two points is simply given by the Pythagoras theorem. You can just join those two points by a line, resolve it along two orthogonal directions, and dz square equal to dx square by dy square gives you the Pythagoras theorem, and it gives you a measure between these two points. And you have the same idea 
of coming up with a distance between two points in a three-dimensional Euclidean space. And you can extend the same idea to a four-dimensional space. But now this four-dimensional space is no longer Euclidean. It is what is called as the non-Euclidean space. So there are four coordinates now, which I represent by the Greek letter mu going from zero, one, two, and three. So zero is included. So there are four coordinates. And in this, the metric, how the distance between the two points are measured, you see this equation ds square equal to um, h nu dq square. h nu are the scale factors uh, which are appropriate for that for the quality of that space. So this is the same kind of equation like dz square equal to dx square plus dy square, except that the metric g is not Euclidean. And uh, this is an orthogonal uh, space, but the metric consists of these factors, which is one, minus one, minus one, minus one. The, there is a change in sign. One sign is different from that of the other three. It doesn't matter, you can choose three plus and one minus. So these are different conventions that you're free to make. Nonetheless, there must be one sign which is different from the other three. So this is the non-Euclidean flat continuum, uh, space-time continuum. And now in this space-time continuum, you can define the four, comp four component electric potentials, um, which you normally recognize as the scalar potential and the vector potential, but these now become uh, four different components, but you can define them in an alternative way also, because you can have the three components of the vector potential first and the fourth scalar potential at the last, and you can have these alternative formulations. You can have alternative expressions for the current also. also. So, so this is the charge multiplied by the speed of light, and this is the current uh, density, and you can have these alternative forms um, of having rho as the zeroth element and j as the next three, or j as the first three and rho as the fourth. So there are these alternative ways of expressing these charge and current densities. And from these, you can rewrite Maxwell's equations, which we had earlier written in um, our ordinary uh, conventional language of del by del t and uh, del by uh, del x, del y, del z, the space and the time derivatives. But now we can get these equations from um, the four potentials and current densities in a very straightforward manner. You get one set of Maxwell's equations, which is the divergence of E and the curl of B from one set of um, potential and the divergence of B and the curl of E from the other set, which is sometimes called as the dual antisymmetric electromagnetic field tensor. So these are some very beautiful things that one can teach from this phenomenology of uh, starting out with the lens Faraday experiment and highlighting that, okay, this is not Galilean relativity, but there is a whole lot of very deep physics which is coming out of it, which brings us to the special theory of relativity. And now it becomes very easy to demonstrate that if you have an electric and magnetic field in some region of space, and now you consider the phenomena, the electromagnetic phenomena in another frame of reference, which is moving at a constant velocity with respect to the previous frame. So it is also in an inertial frame. Then what is an electric field is a superposition of electric and magnetic field in the other. And what is a magnetic field in one frame of reference is a superposition of electric and magnetic field in the other. And this is the mixture. This is the superposition that I mentioned earlier. That in as much as in Maxwell's equations, you find that the vector functions of one are responsible 
um, are responsible for um, um, they, they are expressed as vector functions of another in uh, uh, in, in, in the Maxwell's equations. The actual phenomenon is much more deeper than that because you can actually superpose components of electric and magnetic field and generate electric and magnetic fields in a different frame of reference. So this is a very impressive way of demonstrating the unity of electric and magnetic field. And I always take great pride in sharing with you a work done by some of my students, Chait Chaitanya Da, Srinivas Murthy, and actually this work was really initiated by Satish and Venkatesh. And what they did was to develop a software which showed the motion of charged particles in electromagnetic fields, but they considered this in two different frames of references which are moving at a constant velocity with respect to each other. And as I mentioned, what is an electric field in one frame of reference is a mix of electric and magnetic field in the other frame. And you can therefore compare the observations of the two observers using two different mechanisms. You can set up the equation of motion with the Lorentz force, which is F equal to charge times E plus V cross B in one frame of reference. Solve the equation of motion, get the trajectories of the charged particles. And that is what you see on the left side. But then on the right side, you can solve the same problem using a different way, which is to transform the E and B to the new frame of reference, E prime and B prime, and then set up a new Lorentz force, integrate that equation of motion, and you see that this trajectory is exactly the same as this. And from the congruence of these trajectories, you recognize the unity of the electric and magnetic phenomena and how the special theory of relativity is at its very foundation. So you can carry out this using two transformations and this software is available with us. So feel free to ask for it and use it in your labs. This is a very nice computer simulation experiment, which is discussed in a paper in resonance. It's a very old paper, but I think it is very relevant and very interesting even now. So it demonstrates the connections of electrodynamics and special theory of relativity and brings out the unity of the electromagnetic phenomena in a manner which is even more impressive than what is seen in Maxwell's equations. And then, of course, you can extend this idea further. And you not only show the importance of the special theory of relativity, if you now discuss the role of symmetry again and discuss acceleration due to gravity as would be the same if it would be seen in gravity free space in a rocket which is accelerating uh, at the same acceleration which is 9.8 meters per second per second you will see a certain equivalent um, uh, phenomena and this becomes the foundation of the general theory of relativity. So once again, symmetry plays a big role. And we see that it is important in the general theory of relativity, in the special theory of relativity, in Noether's theorem. And all this comes from the beautiful symmetry that you see in Maxwell's equations. The last point that I would like to emphasize over here is the importance of the divergence and the curl of a vector field. And I already mentioned that both the divergence and the curl are important when you identify the different sources of the electric and magnetic field, which are important to discuss when you discuss, uh, when you explain uh, Maxwell's equations in matter. So both the divergence and the curl are important. And this comes from some very fundamental theorems. Uh, there are two theorems that I want to mention over here. The first theorem is what is called as a uniqueness theorem. And it says that 
if the divergence and the curl of a vector field is provided, it is given in a simply connected region, then if you also know the vector field's normal components at the boundaries of this region, in other words, you know some boundary conditions, then the vector field is uniquely specified. The essential content is that you need both the divergence and the vector, uh, both, both the divergence and the curl of a vector field to uniquely specify the vector field. And that is exactly what the Maxwell's equations are giving you. So they are giving you the divergence and the curl of the electric and magnetic fields. And if you now add the boundary conditions, you can get the electromagnetic fields uniquely. The second theorem, which is of importance over here, that if you know the divergence and the curl of a vector field, both are known, then you can always write it as a sum of an irrotational vector and a solenoidal vector. Solenoidal vector is one whose divergence is zero and an irrotational vector is one whose curl is zero. So, so these theorems have got a very simple proof, but we do not have the time to discuss the proof. I will refer you to some alternative sources. So this second theorem is also called as the fundamental theorem of vector calculus. It tells you that if you know the divergence and the curl of a vector, you write it as a sum of a solenoidal and an irrotational vector. So this is fundamental theorem of vector calculus or better known as the Helmholtz theorem. And um, I would like to point out some sources. There is a very nice paper by Zhao that you may want to read. And I have also discussed some of these things in my recent book on classical mechanics in which some of uh, these phenomena are discussed. But essentially, the point I want to emphasize over here that these are important elements when you discuss the electromagnetic potentials because now you can express the electric and the magnetic fields in terms of the electromagnetic potentials and these potentials are not unique you can write you can have alternative potentials which you get from each other through what are known as gauge transformations so gauge is just uh, a measure as to how you measure these potentials and you can have them as alternative gauges uh, obtained from each other through gauge transformations. And this is this, this could take us deeper into other domains of physics. In particular, we can get into quantum theory at this point, although that is not the subject for uh, today's, uh, today's uh, seminar. Uh, but the potentials, of course, um, are related to the fields. You, you get the fields from the potentials. You can get the potentials from the fields by integrating and putting the boundary conditions. But it is not just a matter of doing some simple vector calculus or differential and integral calculus, which is performing a mathematical operation one way and then reversing it. Because as one gets into quantum physics, the potentials become much more important than the fields. As a matter of fact, when you get into the Schrodinger equation, you deal with potentials and not with fields. You do not work with forces, you work with potentials. And this is beautifully illustrated in the Aronov Bohm effect. So if you do this Young's double slit experiment, with electrons, so you've got an electron source and it goes from slit one and slit two, you know that there is an interference pattern which is formed. But if you now have a, a solenoid and you pass an electric current, so what is interesting is that this magnetic field is solenoidal. The reason it is called as a solenoidal is because that is how the solenoidal magnetic field is seen. It is all contained inside the solenoid. There is uh, outside the magnetic uh, outside the solenoid, the magnetic field is zero. And these electrons, which are going along this path from behind the solenoid or in front of the solenoid, have no way at all of experiencing the magnetic field. Yet, 
when you switch on current and you set up this magnetic field, although these electrons do not experience any magnetic field, what happens is that the fringes, the dark and bright fringes, places of more accumulation and less accumulation of electrons, it actually shifts. So there is a shift from the interference pattern from here to here. And this happens because of the interaction with the potentials. And this highlights the importance of potentials rather than fields in this very beautiful and famous experiment, which is essentially a quantum phenomenon due to the aronov bohm effect. It is closely related to the Berry phase in quantum, quantum mechanics. It can be interpreted in terms of Feynman's path integrals. So I will conclude the talk this talk at this point that um, so many beautiful things can be discussed in the context of the lens faraday experiment and sure enough we have to invoke a good bit of mathematics and we should make absolutely no apology for using mathematics i would like to quote eugene wigner this is one of my favorite quotes uh, in which wigner talks about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and natural sciences. He points out that the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of laws of physics is a wonderful gift that we neither understand nor deserve. The essential point is that this mathematics of vector calculus, uh, tensors and so on, this is an integral part of how nature communicates its laws and these are expressed in rigorous terms and these are formulated whether it is uh, classical laws of mechanics the the role of symmetry the noether's theorem maxwell's equations in electrodynamics and subsequently uh, quantum laws the schrodinger equation and so on so so many beautiful things can be um, brought out from this very simple experiment that we started talking about which is a lens Faraday experiment. That if you have this conductor PQ and move it to the right, you see that a current is set up. We started with contrasting this with the other experiment in which the magnetic field was moved, and we again recognize that a current is set up. And then we allow ourselves to share the excitement which Feynman brings out that there is no other place in physics in which two different phenomena are invoked to explain a general principle. So in the first experiment, you have the Lorentz law. In the second, you have the lens Faraday Maxwell equation. And this is where we find that we have a beautiful opportunity to discuss many important, beautiful concepts in physics. And I went through these six beautiful offshoots of this discussion which is to demonstrate the alternative sources of the electromagnetic field which really helps us appreciate the maxwell's equations in matter and how maxwell's equations in vacuum are a subset and a special case of that we see the unity of electromagnetic field its unity with light and optics the role of symmetry appreciate Noether's theorem uh, understand the constancy of the speed of light, understand time dilation, Lorentz contraction, and the importance of the divergence in the curl of the vector field, and the Helmholtz theorem and the uniqueness theorem. So thank you very much. I will be very happy to take some questions. Thank you, Arati. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. It was indeed a very insightful lecture and very unique in its own way, sir. Uh, I strongly hope that uh, today's lecture would have given a very different perspective of teaching and learning for all the faculty members. So we would like to uh, so ask some questions from the participants. Uh, participants, if you have any uh, participants, if you have any questions, you can, you can give in the chat box or the chat box. Your hand. Your hand.